Hi. Today we are going to go into the nitty gritty of the Devil in the Dark Water and do a spoiler review of the book. If you haven't had a chance to check out the spoiler free review that I did yesterday, I will put it up here. I'm going to try not to repeat myself too much, including the bit about the afterword in the book, which is worth a read all on its own. So if you want to check that out, it's right there. I think it tells you a lot about who Stuart Turton is as a writer and is worth your time. So without any further ado, let's get into it. I love this book. I always enjoy a locked door mystery and it's hard to get any further away from everything than the middle of the ocean. So you know whatever it is, is either already on the boat or it's actually a demon. We start the story in Batvia. Batavia or but Batavia, Indonesia. Oh, okay, Batavia. I was completely ignorant that that was a real place for the entire time I was reading the book. Which, I mean, they were traveling to Amsterdam, which, not to brag, I knew was a real place. So I don't know why I didn't bother looking it up to see where it was. But just in case you also don't know, it is present day Jakarta, Indonesia. Now you know. We don't spend too much time there. That's really just where they get on the boat. But it becomes kind of a character in itself because it is mentioned so often throughout the book. And lots of the characters have reflections about their time there, good and bad. And on the ship, they are transporting spices, which gives it a certain flavor. <laughs> in this case, it's paprika. I enjoyed the description of the heat and the birds ugh, and the markets. We get a little bit of backstory on our main characters and why they are traveling. To sum up, the men are traveling because they're either under arrest, are connected to the guy that's under arrest, and also strangely enough related to the most powerful guy on the ship. Or they are a big, powerful, rich asshole who's going to deliver something to another powerful group of men for, you guessed it, more money and more power. And the women are traveling because the men are traveling and that that's all. Our three main women are Sarah, Leah, and I say it, Cresci or Creasci, but probably my mouth will say Cresci. So anyone who watches my channel regularly knows that I'm a mom because I never shut up about it. Look at them. Look at my babies. They're just so cute. And I loved the motherhood angle with the women. We didn't have bad moms. Somebody's story wasn't, my mom was so bad and that's why I'm bad. We had good moms in bad situations doing the best that they could for their kids. It was just refreshing to have good moms whose entire story didn't revolve around the fact that they were mothers. And there was this wonderful contrast between the women. We had Sarah, who was darker and smart, more stern and proper. She was like some kind of bird. And then we had Cresci, who was this beautiful, buoyant, carefree butterfly kind of a woman. Does anybody else's brains think like this? Just me? And then, get ready, here's the best part. They were both intelligent women. And even Leah, the daughter, was a super genius, which I loved. And she had to hide her brilliance because she was a woman and that that's not cool. I think that the author really could have screwed the whole thing up with these women, but he didn't because he rocks. Okay, so while we're getting ready to board the ship in Batvia, this leopard jumps up on some boxes and projects to the entire crowd a warning about a demon that's gonna kill them all. And he makes this big scary proclamation of doom. And then he bursts into flames. It was very cool. It gets even better when you learn that the leper had no tongue and a bum foot. So he couldn't have even done those things. And we get to learn a lot about Sarah and 
Arendt's characters here, and they're two of our main characters. So it's set up pretty early on that they are the good guys. They end up having a romance, but it is not the main part of the book, and it doesn't affect their characters. It's just a part of the characters. There wasn't a lot of swooning or long, drawn out talks about love. And that's generally how I like my romances. Barely there. So yeah, the leper on the box was where I started rubbing my hands together, going, hoo hoo hoo, I'm gonna like this. Okay, so we got on the ship and it is a lot of boats. Just boating around, doing boat stuff. And we start meeting the other characters who we can all consider to be suspects. We have the captain who is dressed just impeccably and he goes into great detail about his wonderful fancy dress but when it's actually described it sounds so bad and goofy just we have the boatswain who's really just a big raging dickhead but in a in a good way i guess not everyone is going to be likable i think the balance of likable and unlikable characters was really good. I always enjoy a good villain and having characters that I can feel things about, even if that thing is anger and disgust. Okay, so we've got Sammy, who is our super detective, who I thought we were going to be spending way more time with in this book, but he is automatically thrown into boat jail. He is put into the dankest, darkest, just horrible sounding little cellar. I felt claustrophobic reading it. And he's put in there because he did a crime. What crime? We don't know. So that was a little annoying. I figured we would be told eventually so I could wait it out and just hold my seahorses. It did take a long time for the reason to be revealed. And when we do find out, we learn that it was treason. He was being accused of giving secrets to the British. They thought he was a spy. Honestly, I thought mm, that's not good enough to just put him in that gross of a cellar. You're on a boat. Where is he going to go? And people are dying. Things are bad. He's the best detective in the world. I don't know. It just didn't add up to me. Like you could take him out, let him solve the case, and then like just let him ride in a more comfortable cabin until you take him to Amsterdam to get his head chopped off anyways. I don't know. That's what I would have done. It made sense to me. We find out why he didn't later on and okay, okay, fine. But it kind of felt like a plot hole while I was reading it, uh, but I digress. So yeah, boat stuff is happening and we start to learn more about the demon the leper was yelling about on the docks. Cause somehow when they unfurl the sail, the demon's mark is on it. And that was just kind of like, oh no. But demons shmemans, get going, giddy up boat whatever they say on boats. Hoist the anchors. So about the demon, briefly, his name is Old Tom. Aaron basically created Old Tom because when he was little, he went into the woods with his dad and then his dad was killed. Aaron came out days later with no memory and a scary demon mark on his wrist, which was really just a cut. But then everybody thought he killed his dad and they were jerks to him in the village. So he was like, no, nah, no, nah, none of this. And he would sneak out at night and he would carve the demon mark in jerks doors. And this rumor and fear started around the idea of this demon. I mean, Arndt's dad sucked and okay, don't kill people. Obviously don't kill people, but he kind of had it coming. He was pretty awful. So yeah, everybody is losing their minds over this demon and they find an old homeless man and the mob kills him because they have decided that he was the demon and that man's name was old tom and voila old tom is born and the whole village sucked they suck the legend of old tom starts spreading and becoming widely known and people start using it to their advantage so yeah i know people in positions of power use fear to get more power. I too was shocked. And then there is a lot of middle to this book. 
Some might say too much middle, not me. I enjoyed it, but it probably could have had some pruning down and gotten the same story across. I was perfectly happy with the length and the detail myself. I can see it being a complaint though. I liked getting to know the characters and wondering if it was them leaving the demon marks around. In proper mystery fashion, we are given lots of trails to follow and some of them are dead ends. Some of them just give us more questions. Obviously not all of them are gonna lead to the real answer, but they were all fun to go down. Usually the answer at the end of these trails is bloody. As far as I can remember, I don't think that anybody's storyline was left unanswered. So yeah, lots of boat stuff happened. Uh, there was a big storm. It, the boat atmosphere. I, I'm calling it boat stuff, but it really is just all atmosphere. All of the boat stuff is very cool. It's just enough boat stuff to be like, cool, I'm on a boat and this is how boats work but not so much boat stuff that you're like, for the love of God, stop talking about boats. I get it, it's a boat. I'm not gonna take an exam on boats. So yeah, there's mystery and intrigue and a fair amount of time warping because boat trips are long. That did feel weird to me and it wasn't enough to take me out of the story, but it was weird to suddenly lose big chunks of time without the story moving forward. But yeah, it wasn't enough to take me out of it, so I give it a pass. There was enough there in the meantime to keep me thinking. Uh, for example, once the priest and the priest's assistant, once they are linked up with our main cast of sleuths, we get to know more about the demon and what's going on. We learn about Cresci's dead husband who was a demon hunter and we get all of these creepy insights into the demon from the priest's spooky scary demon book. No, that's not what it was called. It was the Demonologica. It sounded really spooky. From there, we learned that somebody on the boat is possessed by the demon. So all of a sudden, everybody is a suspect. The demon is whispering to everybody on the boat at night, which adds to this feeling of, what's it called when God's everywhere? I don't remember. There's like this omnipresence of the demon and the fear keeps growing in everybody, which makes the demon more and more powerful and more of a force to be reckoned with. And all of a sudden, everybody on the boat seemed a little bit suspicious. I kept looking for clues that would tell me who'd done it. And I think looking back on it, they were mostly there, but I did like that it kept me wondering is it actually a demon? Is that gonna be the answer? If it was a demon possessing somebody, then it was both a person and a demon, which seems slightly less ridiculous to me than it just being a demon. If it had actually been a demon in the end, I probably would have felt ripped off because it feels like kind of a cop out. But I liked that it kept me questioning if that was the road the author was going to take. And the fact that I thought it was maybe going to be a human demon hybrid helped me look past a few of the issues with the stuff the demon was doing. In my heart, I didn't think it was a demon, but all signs were pointing to demon. There was one thing though, that I still, two guys could not have slaughtered all of the livestock silently. I am sorry, Stuart Turton, but I am not buying what you are selling on that one. A demon? Okay, sure, a demon could have done it. Two guys? No. No. Sorry. No. That's not how animals work. No. And you could totally bog yourself down with all of the technical details and suck all of the fun and energy out of the book. I don't want to do that. That is not how I wanted to take this story in. So I let a lot of things pass by and not let myself get too critical. And I think that that is one of the reasons that the demon angle really, really helped the story. The novel was more than those technical points. It had an atmosphere and tone that was really satisfying. It had this Sherlock and Watson feel to it while still feeling really unique. There was a lot of death in this novel towards the end. And if it hadn't been so many civilians, 
I probably would have felt a little bit more forgiving towards the bad guys. Because it is the kind of ending that you're supposed to kind of feel forgiving towards the bad guys. So that's different. If it had been only bad guys who died and only the intended targets, who were bad guys who had it coming? I, th I just feel like I, I could have been more forgiving. And the answer was not bad. This is the one place where I think Devil outshines Evelyn Hardcastle. I liked Hardcastle better overall, but the conclusion or the answer to the mystery I think was a lot more satisfying in Devil. Are you ready to hear who did it? Because if somehow you made it this far and you don't want to know who done it, I'm gonna give you three seconds to get the heck out of here. Three, two, one. It was Cresci and Sammy. What? I know, I know. I loved that it answered my nagging question of why aren't they letting Sammy out? Why isn't Sammy being more helpful? It really filled in a bunch of those questions and holes that I was picking up along the way. So yeah, they're siblings. They are brilliant, beautiful, vengeful siblings. They created this incredibly elaborate plan for years to kill the bastards who destroyed their family. They used the demon to exact their revenge. I loved this. I love that they are unmasked, but it doesn't change who they are fundamentally as characters. Like you learn that it's Crest G and she doesn't suddenly become this horrible person or this bad mother. And she doesn't stop loving Sarah and Leah like family. Sammy still loves Arndt and he wants him to forgive him because his friendship does actually mean something to him. I really like it when the bad guys get theirs and when good triumphs. The people who were originally marked to be victims in their plan had it coming. They were awful people. And I just love the revenge angle to the whole thing. And I was really satisfied with the deal Sarah and Arn end up making with Sammy and Kresge. Instead of them turning them in, they decide that all of them are gonna get together and be old Tom. So they're gonna team up and use old Tom as a force for good. Or, well, still bad. But it's against bad guys, which I believe in virtue math equals good. The pros to this book, it had amazing atmosphere, great characters, it was really unique. It had an intriguing mystery, and it was full of bad guys getting theirs. Cons, there were a few holes in the story, and it was maybe a bit long for some people's tastes, but that's completely subjective. And like I've said, for me, it was a five-star read. On a technical level, I can recognize that there were a few problems, but I don't care. I loved it anyways. I would still highly, highly recommend it. It was wonderful. I think that Stuart Turton really excels at creating stories that are unique and the atmosphere in his books are top notch. I will once again be pre-ordering whatever he announces next because he has been two for two with me and therefore he has earned my trust. And that's it. That's my spoiler review of The Devil in the Dark Water by Stuart Turton. Please comment down below. Let me know what you thought of the book. Thank you for watching. If you liked this, please leave a like on the video and subscribe to my channel. I put out a new video every week. I am gonna be doing my reviews this style for a little while where I put out a spoiler free review and then a spoiler filled review. So if you like this format, let me know so I can keep doing it. It's a lot of extra work, so it's nice to know if you like it. Okay, see you next time, bye responsible for their mis- And I think looking back on it, they were mostly- And on the ship, they are transporting spices, which gives it a certain- f Okay, that's enough. <laughs> Thanks guys, love you.